ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಜಾಯಿನ್ meditation and study circle again this evening and we have a rather daunting topic before us wanting to become is a cause of sorrow or a cause for sorrow many may not figure out what exactly this means that's why this lecture goes we will try to throw light on what is meant by wanting to become being a cause of sorrow let me tell you what i will be highlighting for the central part of my lecture wanting to become is a cause of sorrow we say for sorrow ends when there is a deep transformation in us and this deep transformation does not take place by chasing any of the world's dreams any of the goals in this world suppose you and i chase we want to become somebody we want to become something we want to collect something we want to get something we want to get somewhere and so on and so forth none of those goals of the world none of those fancy dreams of the world can bring about deep inner transformation it's only in deep inner transformation that sorrow ends and unless there is that deep inner transformation on one hand nothing of the world can end sorrow but this evening's topic puts it this way everything becomes a cause of sorrow wanting to become is a cause of sorrow for it is like an unending ailment it's like a disease it is nothing other than what the rishi is called bhava roga you have heard the word bhava roga roga means a disease bhava means bhavati becoming when a clerk wants to become a manager when a junior scientist wants to become a senior scientist and the senior scientist wants to become the director of the organization an mp wants to become a pm so on and so forth go anywhere in the world people are caught up in wanting to become so the crux of the matter is to show that unless there is a deep inner transformation sorrow doesn't end and achieving a goal actually in the world actually causes sorrow brings a new kind of sorrow a new dimension of suffering and does not end suffering as one eg rightly said the way this title is put owes to j krishna murti it owes its source or it owes its wording to j krishna murti one of his very thought provoking statements is wanting to become a cause of sorrow now this wanting to become is prevalent everywhere long back i read that the mother of abraham lincoln 
was on her deathbed and Abraham was probably just a teenager at that time. The mother called him to her bedside and whispered in his ears, Dear Abraham, become somebody. And saying that, she breathed her last. This was put in some motivational literature and it was said that, look what happened. Abraham Lincoln's mother said to him before dying, she appealed to him, become something. And you know what he became? He became the president of United States. So, wow. Indirectly, we are told that we must become somebody in life. So this bug is introduced into us, if it's not already there. This bug is induced, is injected into our consciousness, into our psychology. Even if we become a Swamiji in the Haridwar or Rishikesh, Somebody will come along and tell you, you know, you must become a famous Swamiji in this part of the world. You go to, you know, Kolkata and let's say become a Swami in Ramakrishna Mission. <laughs> Both humorously and seriously I am telling you, somebody one day will tell you, you know, in 1893, a Swami from this Kolkata became world famous at the parliament of world's religions. Now you have become a Swami in that very mission which he built. Now it is high time you also become famous. Oh, the world will not let you be at rest. The world will not let you keep the simplicity of a child. The world will somehow if I may use a strong word, poison your mind to chase some dream. And there are umpteen statements in the so-called domain of motivational literature. You become what you dream. Dream big and become big. Blah, blah, blah. It goes. Motivational literature has a place of its own. Its own. I am not decrying that kind of that genre of uh, literature called motivational literature, self-help literature. This literature which uh, asks you to become better. J. Krishnamurti mocked at that literature. He was uncompromising while I personally make some room for motivational literature also. And then, of course, give greater value, attach greater value to transformational literature. Jiddu Krishnamurti did not leave any space for motivational literature. He said, this business of becoming better is like going from a smaller prison to a bigger prison or a prison with better facilities. He said, break the walls of the prison and get free. For so the message of the Upanishads, the message of Jiddu Krishnamurti, the message of Sri, Ra, Sri Ramana Maharshi, Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj, and in a different language, of course, Sri Ramakrishna also. The message of the high plateau teachers and mystics of the world is never about shining in the world. If you shine, that at best is a side product. If you shine, if you become famous, if you build an empire of some spiritual organization, if thousands or tens of thousands or more call themselves your followers, that is not the central part of your work or your life. That could be sometimes accidental, if I may use that humorous word. You know, accident is something that happens unexpectedly, you know, or let me use another word, it could be incidental, 
because accident generally is a word used for something that should not happen. So, incident. So, you may incidentally become rich or famous or popular or guru of a lot of people, etc. But mainly, what is it that makes your life truly a blessing? It is not reaching somewhere. It is celebrating your true nature. And in order that you may know your true nature, the Vedanta and allied you know, literature is uncompromising. The Vedanta says, in order that you may go through a deep inner transformation, you need to know the Self. And the Self in the Vedanta is expressed in two ways when you write it down in English. Self with an uppercase S and the Self with a lowercase S. Capital S or small s. The Self with a small s or lowercase s, that's how J. Krishnamurti uses the word, represents what is explained as the separate self. You look at Mukesh Ambani and you don't say, I am I am Mukesh Ambani and Mukesh Ambani is I. You don't. Mukesh Ambani is separate. I am separate. So I have a sense of I which is different, separate, separate self. So looking at the wealth of Mukesh Ambani, I may at times feel a little depressed or disappointed or dejected or lost. And looking at somebody else in my circle of friends or among my relatives, among my people you know, whom I know, who is way behind in some sense. It's all questionable what you call way behind, what you call way ahead, but in a manner of saying, if you have got two PhDs and that cousin of yours failed for the third time in 10th standard examination, you may feel, I have come way ahead. That cousin of mine has failed. I have succeeded. It may give you temporarily a certain happiness, certain pleasure. But our point now is, there is the separate self. That I am ahead of a hundred people makes you a separate self, not the one self which shines in all life forms. Ishava Upanishad says, when you see the one self in all and all in the one self, then you will be free from sorrow, fear, dejection. Yastu sarvani bhutani atmanne vanupashyati sarva bhuteshu cha atmanu tato na vijugupsate yasmin sarvani bhutani atmai vabhut vijanataha tatra komoha kashokaha ekatvam anupashyataha Mantra 6 and 7 of the Isha Vasya talk about, talk about a unitary vision where there is no one comparing with whom you feel you are small, where there is no one comparing with whom you feel you are big, for there is no one other than you. This is mind-boggling. Many may not understand what this is all about. It looks like some poetry. Can it really happen at all? Coming to Lincoln's mother, she is not the only one. All over the world there are mothers and fathers, elder brothers and elder sisters, mamas and mommies and chachas and chachis who make the life of a youngster miserable by injecting into that youngster an idea that unless she becomes something or he reaches somewhere, uh, he or she is miserable, you know, a failure. Once uh, way back, I think I was myself in 12th standard. You know, 12th standard is uh, where the following year you go to college. 
maybe you go to into some professional course or what not i was myself aiming at engineering or medicine or some sort of that that was the conditioning prevalent at that time and i had a friend i remember his name also dinesh pai one evening i and dinesh pai and i were about to take a walk in my small town called pundapur and dinesh said today we are going for a walk as we did a few times before but today my mama also will join us i said fine so dinesh myself and dinesh mama maternal uncle i guess we were walking on the roads towards a certain maidan certain field in our town and this mama began he first said to dinesh i am telling you in front of your classmate and friend now you both are in 12th standard and you must make it to the iit because after 12th standard there is what is called g g is not gandhi ji or nehru ji j e e joint entrance examination for admission to the iits and dinesh was already tense oh my mama began his discourse now the mama said i tell you if you don't make it to the iit your life is a waste but dinesh probably had heard it many times he remained non challenged he did not say anything though a bit depressed he looked the mama then turned to me that's what i want to share with you he said to me you know i think you are very disciplined and you seem to be studying very well and i hear that you are one of the bright students in uh, dinesh class now please tell dinesh that he has to work hard he has to make it to the iit so mama aimed his gun at me after somewhat failing uh, in his task with his, his own nephew mama wanted to inject into me the achievement bug go into iit go into some prestigious medical college become somebody so abraham lincoln's mother had that bug and this the mama of dinesh had incidentally neither dinesh nor i went into iit <laughs> after 12th i got a chance 5 years later to do an mtech that's a different story but i went to an ordinary engineering college in davangere dinesh actually i don't know maybe he also went to one of the colleges engineering colleges but you see i'll give you one last example which is a bit humorous also a father in new delhi said to his daughter who was about 17 or 18 years old the father said to the daughter oh dear do you know at your age indira gandhi was student union leader in shanti niketan and you don't seem to have arrived anywhere that daughter yes had not arrived anywhere academically or in any extra curricular activities but she was smart enough clever enough to say to the father father it is true that indira gandhi became a student union leader in shanti niketan at the age of 17 or 18 but when she came to your age she became the prime minister of the country where are you that father said don't talk back like that so the whole world is driven by ambition driven by aspiration incidentally upanishads also talk about ambition and aspiration in fact chandogya upanishad in that very portion which i am going to quote a little later in the context of deep inner transformation in that very chapter chandogya upanishad chapter 7 talks about sankalpa talks about asha talks about very many aspirations very many forms of energy flowing in you without using the word adrenaline the Chandogya Upanishad does talk about certain ideas, visions where adrenaline will flow in you, and you roll up your sleeves. I will achieve this goal. The great Vedanta Swami Vivekananda also went around saying 
Arise, awake, and stop not till your goal is reached. Therefore, here I step aside from J. Krishnamurti. I make some room for motivational literature. In the language of Bhagavad Gita, those of us who have some tamas in us, who have some laziness in us, who don't have energy to step forward in any direction, leave alone the higher philosophy, we need to sometimes you know, take a goal, take a dream, and chase it. But on a higher plane, when you really arrive at that higher plane, the same you who once needed a goal, a direction, a dream, you know, etc., to get get going, to keep moving at a higher level, you may have to, you will have to drop everything. I don't have to become anybody. You don't want to become anybody, you don't want to reach anywhere, then why are you living? You may as well die, somebody may say. You smile and say, sorry, if you have not understood what I am saying, that's your problem. I don't want to become anyone because I have clearly understood becoming anyone in the material world or in the so-called spiritual world means really nothing you are miserable in yet another way. As long as the separate self continues to raise its ugly head, you will not be free from sorrow. So if I may quote one more statement from J. Krishnamurti, he said, sorrow does not end by self-improvement. Sorrow ends by ending of the self. You may wonder what under the sun is this ending of the self. Let's go to the Upanishad. That very seventh chapter, which talked about you know gathering energies of the mind, having a certain goal, meditating on a certain devata, certain divine figure or divine image, because the you know the Khandas, that is the sections of the seventh chapter, many sections actually, talk about you know, how we need strength, valam. Another section talks about how we need radiance on our face, teja. Another section says we must eat good food, right food, annam. <laughs> then another talks about we must have resolve, sankalpa shakti. Another says, Asha, you must have an aspiration. You know, a Brahmachari aspires after studying the Vedas. The Brahmachari aspires to set up a Gurukula, which would be maybe bigger than the Gurukula where he studied under a very competent teacher. That aspiration is called Asha. And Sanat Kumara, the teacher in the seventh chapter of Chandogya Upanishad honors and respects all of them. But then the seventh chapter begins in a rather pensive, sad tone. Narada, who has studied a lot of scriptures, is well received in the three worlds. Devendra, the king of heaven, stands up to receive Narada if Narada shows up in his court. Devendra comes down from his throne and comes to the gates or comes to the entrance of the hall and says, Devarshi Narada, I welcome you to my court. Such Narada goes to Sanat Kumara to say, I am not happy. Don't be surprised if Mukesh, Ambani or Ratan, Tata or Bill Gates or what is that, uh, you know, the man you know, known with the Tesla and so on. In privacy, they may say to you, yeah, yeah, the whole world talks about me, but you know what, I am not happy. <laughs> like Narada, they don't be surprised if they are all unhappy. And Narada makes an interesting confession. He says, 
who revered sir addressing the young sanat kumara the elderly narada says oh revered sir from people like you from wise people like you i have heard maya shrutam what have i heard one who knows the pure self not the separate self one who knows the pure self crosses sorrow for good tarati shokam atmavit iti asma bihi shrutam but have i crossed sorrow in no way at times i have bouts of sorrow at times i feel my life is going for waste i don't think i have reached or have arrived anywhere a sense of incompleteness apurnata disturbs me torments me and that is how sanat kumara in that seventh chapter of the chandogya upanishad very patiently inquires of narada tell me first what you have studied what are the skills what are the subjects that you have mastered and narada gives a long list and then sanat kumara says yes i understand like the subjects that universities offer in the 21st century that they will be offering he must have said future tense today you and i are in 21st century ad and universities around the world offer such a wide range of subjects but rest assured anyone who excels in one of them two of them or 10 of those subjects cannot be truly happy in a holistic sense in the sense of lasting happiness they have, they would they will have their own agitation so sanat kumara says na alpe sukhamasti towards the end of that seventh chapter in whatever is finite there cannot be lasting happiness ayaram gayaram happiness you know for a while you are so happy as the expressions go you are on cloud 9 or you are in the seventh heaven there are so many expressions ananda mahadananda paramananda etc you may claim for a while after a little while you are back to square one if not worse than before the human mind is such a vicious thing this mind of ours can make us very happy here and there but then very viciously pull us down to such low levels of emotional disturbance we feel so lost so why does that happen upanishads use this language there is the sense of i described in a certain way good or bad accomplished or far away from any achievement no matter what once you describe yourself through thinking through thought which is always conditioned which is always influenced by a whole lot of uh, you know uh, factors which are all questionable somewhere you might have been influenced to think that to be a professor at oxford or cambridge harvard or stanford would be ah would be the pinnacle of success in life there are hundreds if not thousands of people who have been professors who are professors and so on can you think they are truly happy unless they have gone through an inner transformation but your mind might be conditioned conditionings are of various kinds there was a time i myself believed that those with spectacles those with glasses are more intelligent then life taught me that the truth is far from that there are people who think uh, going by color of skin going by length of the nose going by, i don't know how many things there exist in this world but and people believe you know that 
oh that man that lady must be very happy by seeing something external you come to know somebody lives in zurich you come to know somebody lives in melbourne australia it's possible that you are conditioned to think logically it is such a silly mistake but you are conditioning would make you think oh really your daughter is in melbourne she must be having no problem how stupid in melbourne or sydney in zurich or san francisco everywhere life is the same when i first went to usa in 1993 three months after my guru swami chinmayananda you know dropped his body though i am well read and everything i went there and i wrote not email email was about to come those days i think i wrote some ordinary letter in which i wrote with humor as well as with a little touch of you know seriousness i have come to america for the first time but one thing i notice is here also the sun rises in the east so the person in uh, back in india who received the letter must have laughed i laughed when i wrote that also but you know this human mind is treacherous it comes under various conditionings it is those conditionings which create the limited idea limited i the self i am good i am bad i am accomplished i am a failure i am notorious i am highly respected i have a long way to go we have been fed with this kind of motivational literature which i has a place but if you want the lasting peace you must graduate to a higher level where that very same motivational literature should be thrown lock stock and barrel never to be picked up again motivational let lit, motivational literature arise away go achieve put your flag on that peak let your name come in the hall of fame and there are so many ways in which people motivate right all that is a phase in life it's a passing phase it's okay you go through it but you must let go of it so central to this higher insight is the fact that you must appreciate or understand all growth all development all becoming abraham lincoln became the president of usa indira priyadarshini became union student union leader a refugee from hitler's nazi germany a Jewish refugee, Andy Grove or someone, goes with five dollars in his hands. Later on, he runs the famous Intel company, takes the company called Intel to DC Heights. Wow, oh, you and I. Now also you and I get WhatsApp messages with the nice collage of some 25 or 30 people of Indian origin men and some women also who are heading corporate bodies in corporate entities in the usa we are you know thrilled all right all right but the point is that which becomes at one time andy grove was a refugee who somehow survived the holocaust and landed in the United States. He had only five dollars. Worked here, worked there, learned some electronics, learned a little bit of semiconductor stuff, and then slowly he arose. So he became the world famous Andy Grove. Geoff Bezos resigned a very good job. His parents were aghast. Why did you leave such a very lucrative job? And he became the founder and the most successful man behind Amazon. 
So you and I read all this. But now without giving more examples, without wasting time on them, the thing that becomes is the separate self and whether you like it or not, higher wisdom says this separate self is an illusion. You are not that separate self at all. Narada was anchored in the separate self. Narada was chasing yet another goal, yet another goal. Narada wanted to become yet something else, maybe looking at a king, maybe looking at a scholar, maybe looking at a child, maybe looking at someone in the world and somewhat becoming envious. Some of you, while you hear speakers like me, some of you, not all, some of you, you know, some of you may envy, wow, Swamiji speaks, how oh, nice, I wish I could become a speaker. For heaven's sake, don't try to become a speaker. Becoming a speaker does not give you true happiness. But it is likely that people become envious of a wealthy man, of a singer, of a speaker, of a, a gold medalist, Olympic medalist, athlete. There are so many things which you can become, but none of them frees you from the limited, separate self. Narada's problem was that. And Sanat Kumara, towards the end of that seventh chapter of Andogya Upanishad, says, Na alpe sukamasti. Even multi, multi, multi billionaire also is finite. One who has written volumes of, you know, some works which have become immortal. Or in olden days, Kalidasa, Shakespeare and so on. Finite. They did not touch infinity. So, Alpa means finite. In the finite, there is no happiness. It is the bombshell that Sanat Kumara throws. Then where is happiness? That seventh chapter is in fact called Bhuma, Bhuma Vidya. Yo vai Bhuma Tat Sukham. Bhuma means the infinite. And you and I would try to imagine infinity as maybe the universe spreading in all directions, space spreading in all directions, time having no beginning, having no end, we try to objectify even infinity. But the approach of the mystical science of the Upanishads is to point out. Upanishads say, when you understand that there is no separation between what you regarded as the other before, and what you regarded earlier as you. This is me and that is not me. The separation, the dividing wall, dividing line between not me and me is erased in a mystical spiritual insight. Therefore, Sanat Kumara's answer or pointer to that Bhuma is Yatra nanyat pashyati, pashyati, yatra nanyat srinoti, yatra nanyat jigrati, yatra nanyat vedayate, and so on. There's a string of where you do not see anything else. And that needs certain competent guidance for one to understand. It doesn't mean one becomes blind or deaf or you know loses one's sense perceptions. It is what was looked at as the other, not me, ceases to be not me. It is pure awareness. I am that where really there is no possibility of comparison. You don't envy, you are not jealous of somebody 
who apparently has achieved more, nor are you thinking of yourself as higher than somebody who, in your ignorance, you labeled as less accomplished or lagging behind. There are all these are names and forms. Therefore, Ananta is how Vedanta puts it. Bhuma means Ananta. Therefore, excellent speakers, teachers like Vimala Takar talk extensively about two domains of operation of human intelligence. Human intelligence can operate in the domain of becoming. And all around people are using intelligence to become and they are becoming something. But they are facing new challenges. One is the domain of becoming where sorrow does not end. And the second one is the domain of being. One of the books of the lady Vimla Takar, some of you have perhaps studied her books or her works. She initially was with Vinoba Bhave, later on was deeply touched by J. Krishnamurti, and then she independently went around sharing her insights around the world. Going around the world is not important, but in a manner of saying, this external glitter and glamour is another Maya. But sometimes we have to describe someone in those terms. So whether you go around, you go to cities or you live in an unknown village, unknown to many people, it makes no difference. The crux of the matter is, are you caught in wanting to become? Then there is a fundamental error that you have conceived yourself to be limited. Holding on tightly to that idea, I am a sinner, I am a sadhak way behind on the scale of evolution. I lack discipline, I da 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 da. You describe yourself in hundred ways, you whip yourself with a, you know, with a whip, you beat yourself, right? And another day, when you get up early one morning, normally you get up with great difficulty at seven. One morning you got up at four and meditated for half an hour. You pat yourself on the back. I think now I'm getting getting on the track finally. And then after half an hour of meditation at 4 a.m., you know, the thought process then says, you are so good today. Then you say, this is time to celebrate. And you go to the kitchen and eat some Haldiram's namkin and take two cups of strong coffee. Then you feel so bad. Then you sleep from 5.30 to 8.30, you sleep. Then you get up and say, what a sinner I am. How it began so well at 4 a.m. And later on again, I slipped. My dear, Upanishads would say, you were not something holy when you were woke, up at four, woke up at 4. That was one error to think I am holy because I got up at 4 and meditated on Aham Brahmasmi or something of that sort. And you were not a sinner when you felt tired, slept, and so on. These are all play of the mind. Be less judgmental, if not non-judgmental. Judge not others, judge not yourself. Which doesn't mean you become irresponsible. Watch, observe, notice what is happening. But stay on guard. Be on guard. Even as you try to pigeonhole somebody, that person will never realize Brahman, your mind may want to say. Or some other day, you may want to say something negative about yourself. There's a saying in English I'm fond of, those who kill by the sword also die by the sword. If we become judgmental, this man is a frustrated human being, that lady is a wicked person, this person is so selfish and that person is so dullard, unintelligent. Like this, we are going around judging people, let us say. Then, 
you cannot help that this mind will judge yourself. The day you get up early, it will judge you favorably. The way you get the day you get up late, or in many other ways, materially also. The day you made some money, extra money, you will feel on top of the world. Another day you lose some money, you feel so down. Those who kill by the sword also die by the sword. So can we be non-judgmental? And once more, to be non-judgmental is not to shut our eyes, not to see things. But it is to see things, but to have a broader angle of view. And to do what is appropriate with no personal dislike or like. You see somebody who is efficient, take her in your team. You see somebody utterly inefficient, relieve him from your team in some project. But the person whom you took in, in your team, should not be one to whom you get attached, etc. And the person you relieved from a certain team because of his or her inefficiency, don't cling to an opinion. Who knows, that same person learns some lessons in a short while, in another company, in another project, somewhere, she or he shines. All of us can change. Therefore, to cling to a judgment, and coming to the topic, to the center of the topic, to label ourselves as I am nowhere, I want to become, before I breathe my last, if not, all the 150 countries of the world, I don't know the correct number, random, I said 150. I must at least travel to 12 countries. My cousin has gone to 20 countries. My own son and daughter have traveled so much, but I have so far gone only to Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. What is all this foolish thinking? I want to become someone who has traveled to many countries. They're all silly goals. But if you are in the motivational domain, it may help you. It may pull you out from tamas. It may pull you out from laziness, some desire. Therefore, Upanishads are so balanced. At right places, they actually encourage you. Asha is aspiration, hope. They even talk about DDD. DDD is our modern expression. Deep driving desire. Rahadaranya Kopanishad in one of the mantra says, if you deeply and strongly desire something, then, this is my interpretation, it says in its own words, if you deeply desire something, that deep driving desire will not only gather all your energies and make them flow in a certain direction, even the energies in the world will fall in place to help you progress in that direction. This is all motivational stuff. Rather than suffering in scattered energy, you and I could arrive at a certain situation, certain scenario where our energies are focused. Then we become somebody. We reach somewhere. Don't stop there. Then go to the higher level. Question that very idea. I used to be a failure and now I am quite a successful man. Question both those ideas. Who was a failure? Who is a success? Maharshi Ramana comes in there in a big way. Who are you? Ask yourself, who am I? Right? Maharshi Ramana did not feel, you know, feel embarrassed or he did not feel low or high when visitors of different kinds came to meet him. Babu Rajendra Prasad, the president of India, came to pay respect to Maharshi Ramana. Ramana was receiving him. He received him with love and regard, but that's about it. Of course, he, he ensured that uh, whoever was at the ashram with him, arranged some basic, you know, 
uh, things which would be which would be appropriate an appropriate welcome not in a bomb you know bombastic manner not with any pomp and show but certainly when the president of india comes certain arrangements were made to receive him in a dignified manner but personally in the heart of ramana we have all the reason to believe that ramana remained unmoved he did not feel oh a big man is coming i am a small man in front of him no way and imagine another day somebody who had been released from a jail after 10 years in jail for some murder or something i mean this i don't know any particular case but suppose some such person came ramana would not feel in his bosom here as a sinner this is not a place for him to come why does he come here no with a certain inner silence with certain sympathy with certain compassion with certain broader angle of view yeah he is a jail bird he has spent 10 years in prison because of a heinous murder he had committed 10 years ago today he is released and he has come to see me but who knows he might be having a pure mind now of course maharshi and such sages were able to see more than what others could see those powers they had that's a different story but as applicable to this gnana yoga this way of wisdom you know to begin with you and i free ourselves from clinging to a self judgment be aware of your shortcomings but don't hurriedly label yourself as useless or bad or sinner etc be aware of your strengths or talents or positive side of your personality but do not hurriedly put a good label on yourself i am good i am bad it's all a play of thought inquire who am i therefore to conclude we would say wanting to become chasing a certain goal or position etc involves a certain fundamental error of taking yourself to be somebody something of certain particular description that taking yourself to be somebody with certain description is not the truth about you you are not confined or bound you are not enclosed in that verbal description in that description made by thought be aware of it but begin or, or continue to inquire to study the upanishads and try to anchor yourself in what cannot be described let me conclude my words saying you when described is the separate self you when not described and being not describable is the truth of your existence sorrow ends when you remain that pure self beyond description sorrow does not end in being the separate self no matter what you become it becomes the cause of another form of sorrow these are the insights that we receive from great wise people which make lot of sense and you and i need to dwell on them contemplate on them while discharging our duties while being sensitive to people around us while being sensitive to our own physical and emotional needs yeah we cannot neglect that we must save some energy we must save some time for deliberating on such insights as pointers to the pure self for that is the way to liberation to ending of all sorrow om namah shivaya